joy of the Lord. In this second part of my series on the Bible, I will focus on how we got the Bible. The Bible is God's love story for his people. The story developing and deepening through the Old Testament till its fulfillment in Jesus. And this good news in Jesus is then taken by the apostles to the ends of the earth as Jesus had commissioned them. But how do the various books by different authors come to be written and to be combined into one book, giving the story from creation to the call of Abraham, formation of the nation of Israel, the Gospels of Jesus, the letters of the apostles, all spread over thousands of years, yet in one book. Of course, it cannot be understood as any other novel which has a single author even though the Bible has one divine author. Nor can we compare it to an edited book containing different book chapters by different authors, as educational books are, all written at one given period, each chapter having no connection or reference to preceding individual chapters most often. Since the Bible has a continuity right through, being a book recording salvation history, the Old Testament pointing to the coming of the Messiah Jesus in the New Testament, while the New Testament makes constant reference to the Old Testament, as Jesus himself would say, you have heard it said, Matthew chapter 5, or it is written in response to the tempter in the desert, Matthew and Luke chapter 4, that he has come to fulfill the law and the prophets, Matthew 5, 17, the Gospel according to St. Matthew, constantly making reference to such prophetic fulfillments in Jesus. Or as St. Paul makes reference to Abraham in the book of Romans and to various incidents in the life of Jesus. How did this all come together? I would encourage you, dear viewers, to make your own personal study on this topic, reference from Vatican, Chap Vatican Council II document Dei Verbum the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and for those who wish, the Jerome's Biblical Commentary. Let us look at the writing of the Old Testament first. The very first point to note is that the Bible was not written as events occurred. For example, the author could not have written about the creation of the universe, as mankind was created only on the sixth day in his story. Indeed, only God existed and the earth was a formless void. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Again, Abraham lived in the 19th century BC, about 1850, but the Pentateuch, in which ex, uh, Abraham is mentioned, began to be committed to writing only in the 10th century, although a couple of passages did exist in the 12th century. One of these being Israel's song of victory the Lord had gained for them against Pharaoh when they crossed through the Red Sea. There were initially two different sources of writings or traditions. The Yahwistic, J, which used the name Yahweh in the 10th century, and the Elohistic, which used the name of Elohim, E, for God in the 9th century, which were combined after the fall of the northern kingdom of the ten tribes of Israel and their deportation to Assyria at the beginning of the 8th century BC. The priestly tradition was then written concerning laws and Deuteronomic tradition which came in last mainly in the book of Deuteronomy. Now these four different writings or traditions were compiled only in the 5th century BC after the exile to Babylon of the southern kingdom towards the end of the 6th century BC. Therefore, we can see that the Bible began to be written many, many years later from the reference point of the people's faith experience. The second aspect to be considered is how was the story of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, of Joseph, of Moses and the Exodus, written after nine centuries and more we find an answer in Exodus chapter 12, verse 26. And when your children ask you, what do you mean by this observance, you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord. 
and again in Exodus chapter 13 verse 14. When in the future your child asks you, what does this mean? You shall answer, by strength of hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery, when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go. And then it continues, and therefore I sacrifice to the Lord every male that first opens the womb, but every firstborn of my sons I redeem. By strength of the hand of the Lord, we were brought out of Egypt. The head of the household would recount the deeds of the Lord in bringing them forth from the bondage of slavery in Egypt to freedom of the promised land, which has become symbolic of the sacrifice of Jesus, the Paschal Lamb slain for us, to liberate us from bondage of slavery and sin to freedom in Christ and eternal life. This personal encounter with God was so great, it had to be communicated. The only way then was to relate the experience and the best way to record it for posterity was to repeat it down the ages. It was in fact from the person, people's experience of God saving them through the exodus that scripture began to be written down. Thirdly, the compilation of different traditions, I mentioned four, explains why there are repeats in the texts the story and sequence sometimes at variance with each other. For example, the very first two chapters on the account of creation are by two different traditions and the story varies because they are writing from their experience. The story of creation and indeed Genesis chapter 1 to 1126 are primordial history that is prehistorical books written out of the lived and shared faith experience of the people of a God of infinite love and compassion, Isaiah chapter 49 verses 15 and 16 tells us. God speaking to his people through the prophet, I will never forget you, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hand. Their experience of a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Psalm 103 verse 8. Both creation accounts show that God is love and love is loved when it is shared. So he created a beautiful world and then created the human person as the pinnacle of his creation. In his image, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 or in Genesis chapter 2 7, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life the divine element enfleshed in the human person. We also find repeats in the text in the story of Abraham. The point we must remember is that we should not reach the, read the Bible as a book of history in time, but rather as the history of God's salvation of his people and draw on the essence of what the writer wishes to convey about God's steadfast and covenanted love for his people. Again, in chapter 3, we must understand the imagery used which arose out of their faith life, their repeated fall into sin and experience of God's loving mercy. Why was the serpent made to represent the devil or the tempter? The Israelites had gone through the experience of living amongst pagan people who observed pagan cultures. These were a constant temptation to Israel that drew them away from their fidelity to the one true God. Part of that pagan worship was a fertility cult which had the serpent as a symbol. The serpent was also a symbol of evil as they had experienced during the 40 years of their wandering in the desert when they got bitten by serpents and died. The authors therefore representing in the serpent the people's experience of their temptation and disobedience to a God who is all loving and compassionate, who did not leave them aside but promised them salvation. It is only through understanding divine inspiration of the author that we can understand Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. The promise of one, the Messiah, the offspring of a woman, the new Eve, who would bruise the head of the serpent. Fourthly, we also find that earlier translations of the first five books, the Pentateuch, 
are referred to as the first book of Moses, commonly called Genesis, or the second book and so on. As we have seen that these books in major part were written well after the time of Moses. We will also read the account of Moses' death in the last chapter of the fifth book, obviously written by a close follower, not by Moses himself. But Moses was the greatest leader of the people that they had, as recorded in the very last three verses of the book. With great respect and being virtually the human author of their destiny, as guided by God, the writers ascribed the five books to Moses and therefore you have the book of Moses. Similarly, the 150 Psalms were not all composed by David, some of them being post-exilic hymns, that means after the exile. Nor was the entire book of Isaiah written by Isaiah, but by other distinct authors also. The sectees sections termed as Deutero-Isaiah and Trito-Isaiah. These were written over a period of time and ascribed to them for their greatness in all that they did. The writing material initially used was papyrus, made from reeds, but this tended to turn brittle with age. Parchment from leather or more expensive vellum, the soft skin of calves, was then used. The Hebrew script was written vertically and Strips of papyrus were stuck on together at the side so as to form a long roll called a scroll for the entire compiled book, sometimes even 35 feet in length. The leather strips were formed into a book termed as codex or codices plural. Now recall Luke chapter 4 when Jesus took up the scroll of Isaiah. This is what he would have used. These scrolls would have undergone several copies over the years. Indeed, none of the original writings exist. The Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in the Qumran Caves, 11 in number, in 1946 to 56, contained almost all of the Hebrew scripture. The Hebrew text used was known as the Masoretic text and had 39 books in use. Some parts of scripture were also written in Aramaic. This was when the people had gone into exile they began to forget their language that was Hebrew, very much like when people go across to another country and begin to speak the language that is prevalent there and forget their own mother tongue. They began to speak Aramaic. In the time of Jesus, the scribes were responsible for writing, copying the texts of scripture, and knowing the law, they functioned as lawyers, while the Pharisees were teachers of the law. This served for the transmission of the law. After all, not everyone would have been able to read the text nor have access to a copy. That is why Jesus would say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. The stress on the heard it said. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount gives this. With the conquest of Alexander the Great in the early 4th century BC, Greek language was introduced and in the 3rd century the Hebrew text was translated into Greek by 70 learned men and hence termed the Septuagint. It is believed that this translation was also prompted by the Holy Spirit. It was at this time that seven additional books were written including the book of Daniel, Sirach, Esther and 1st, 2nd Maccabees in Aramaic as I explained during the post-exilic period. These were also included in the Septuagint. These were not in the Masoretic Hebrew text already in use amongst the people and were later termed as Apocrypha or Deuterocanonicals and accepted by the Catholic Church as inspired writing. The Protestant churches accepted the Hebrew text of 39 books. The early Christians in the first century used this Greek translation. In the mid first century BC, Israel had come under Roman rule that continued through the time of Jesus and the early church for the next 500 years. As Christianity spread throughout the Roman world, there was a need for a Latin text. 
It was then that the Septuagint was translated into Old Latin in the 3rd century AD. But there began to be copies and copies of the Latin text that began to get diversified. In the 4th century AD, Saint Jerome, being himself well versed with Hebrew language, translated the original Hebrew text into a colloquial or spoken Latin known as the Vulgate, coming from the word vulgus, the common people or masses, that is, the language of the people. Using translators for books in Aramaic or Greek text of books not in the Hebrew scripture. He wanted that ordinary Christians of the Roman Empire should be able to read the word of God. For, as he said, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. Coming to the writing of the New Testament, we must realize that 1. Jesus taught and healed his words and deeds. He did not write, nor did his disciples write as they went along. Second, the apostles, in obedience to the great commission, a command by Jesus to them, to take the good news to the ends of the earth, did so faithfully. But the words and deeds of Jesus were not yet recorded. They preach from their soul-stirring encounter of the Paschal mystery of the risen Lord Jesus Christ so vividly imprinted upon their hearts and minds and in the power of the Holy Spirit, all that they now recalled Jesus said and had done. For as Jesus had promised, the Holy Spirit will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. John chapter 14 verse 26. And that is indeed what happened. The apostles preached what is known as the kerygma, in Greek, or proclamation as seen in Peter's first sermon, Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 39, that Jesus attested by God, known for his word and deed, his teachings and miracles, who was crucified and died, but God raised him up. He ascended to the right hand of the Father, that is, he has taken his place of authority with God the Father, and has sent his Holy Spirit upon those who believe. We must repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This was the essence of the kerygma, the very heart of the gospel, the core message of the Christian faith that all believers are called to proclaim. It serves as an introduction to the person of Jesus the Christ and to draw one to conversion and believe in Jesus. St. John Paul II in Redemptoris Missio chapter 40, number 44 states, The subject of proclamation is Christ who was crucified, died and is risen. Through him is accomplished our full and authentic liberation from evil, sin and death. Through him God bestows new life that is divine and eternal. This is the good news which changes man and his history and which all peoples have a right to hear. Number four, as the community of believers grew not only in the numbers but also in the expression of their faith life, pastoral needs arose. The apostles taught them as Jesus had taught them. This was known in Greek as didache or teachings or catechesis doctrinal and moral teaching, and instruction in the faith for the baptized. Sacramental life also began to develop, including ordination of deacons, Acts 6, 5 and 6, and of priests and bishops, we have Timothy was the first bishop of Ephesus, and anointing of the sixth, that's in James chapter 5, verse 14. 5. The very first text to be written was not the gospel, but the Two letters of St. Paul to the Thessalonians around 50 to 52 AD. We then have his pastoral letters to the Corinthians, Philippians, Romans, Galatians. We have the letter of St. James, which arose from the need to sustain the faith of communities established through the preaching of the apostles, exhorting and admonishing them wherever there were aberrations or they were straying from the principles of faith. 
sixth, the Gospels began to be recorded as eyewitnesses began to die out. The first, the eyewitnesses were those who had been with Jesus. And the first account to be written was that by St. Mark around 65 AD. He was a close companion of St. Peter, from whom it is likely that he obtained first-hand accounts about Jesus. He is possibly the young man mentioned in his account, Mark chapter 14 verse 51, who fled from the scene when Jesus was taken captive in the garden of Gethsemane, leaving his clothing behind in the hands of his would-be captor. The synoptics, the Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, are so called because of the similarities between them, with Matthew and Luke borrowing from Mark's own account. But they also have their own distinct sections, each with a particular focus and for a specific audience. The sequence or particulars of events do not tally, but once again we should not get caught with non-essentials about which account is most accurate or which incident occurred first and which later. Recall, they wrote the accounts many years later from memory, relying on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but more importantly, as inspired by the Holy Spirit, they had in mind their target audience and strove to write a convincing account of the truth in the person of Jesus, the only way to salvation. Mark wrote for the Gentiles in Rome, though he later preached in Alexandria, Egypt. Matthew, one of the chosen twelve, wrote for the Jewish converts and refers to Jewish customs and constantly shows Jew Jesus as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. To convince them that this was the Messiah they were all longing and waiting for. It was written around 70 to 80 AD. Luke, a physician, accompanied Paul and wrote around 80 to 85 AD for the Greek diaspora Gentiles, that is outside. He highlights the anavim, the poor in spirit, the involvement of women in the ministry of Jesus and has a special Lucan section. He then continued his writings with the Acts of the Apostles, describing the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church, the missionary journeys of Paul and the spread of the gospel. John, he refers to himself in the gospel as the one whom Jesus loved, wrote around 95 AD for Gentile Christians and appears to presuppose the synoptic gospels. He wrote therefore for growth in Christian maturity and has a strong focus on sacramental life, baptism, Eucharist, living waters of the Holy Spirit, he states the purpose of his gospel in chapter 20, verse 31, that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This was the purpose of his gospel. So the formation of the gospel had three stages. This is given to us in Dei Verbum number 19 and the Catechism number 126. The first stage, the life and teaching of Jesus. Second, the oral tradition of preaching and teaching by the apostles, eyewitnesses of Jesus' life and teaching. And third, the written gospel, a fourfold text, because it is one gospel of Jesus Christ written by four evangelists. Point seven, the New Testament books were completed by the end of the first century AD, the Apostolic Age. As the gospel spread, texts began to be written in different languages and copies of copies were made. We now come to the formation of the Bible. We have reached a point in the history of the Bible where there exists the written word of the Old Testament and several other writings which the Jews did not accept what was included in the Septuagint and the Vulgate, in the Greek and Latin texts. The New Testament and also where several other writings or Gospels, other than the four we have seen and known about, and copies and copies of texts and translations, all done by hand and with possibilities of human error of repetitions of words, phrases, 
sentences as can occur in such a process. The early Hebrew writings had no punctuations. To better understand, we can refer to the text in Matthew chapter 3 verse 3 with respect to John the Baptist. He writes, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3 we say, a voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make a straight path in the desert, a highway for our God. So you see that one says, in the wilderness there is a voice crying out, and Isaiah says, in the wilderness, prepare a path. The gospel text by Matthew states that a voice is crying out in the wilderness because he referred to John the Baptist who lived in the wilderness and whose message was a call to repentance in preparation of the imminent, the close coming of the Messiah. While Isaiah text was translated earlier as preparing a way in the wilderness of our waywardness that we might prepare our hearts to welcome the Messiah. The main message remains the same, a call to repentance. The preceding phrase lends a different perspective to the message. Now, these punctuations, etc., were introduced much later on. Similarly, chapters were introduced into the texts of the Bible only in the early 13th century AD and verse numbering in the mid-16th century, which has become such an important part of reading, studying and referring to the text for us today. Thanks to the study of the church, Dei Verbum number 8, great scripture scholars, exegetes, that is those who interpreted the text of the Bible through study of the text in the earliest form available of Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek and Latin, as well as from the existing life of faith handed down from apostolic times, that is directly from the apostles and from the early church fathers, those of the first few centuries, most of whom were bishops or theologians, responsible mainly in defending and teaching Catholic doctrines and whose writings explained key scriptural principles in the early church. The church discerned the scriptural texts, what was true and what were mere pious stories, and checked out errors in manuscripts through the study of the various texts, so as to determine the most original, authentic and inspired text. And the church councils between 382 and 397 gave us the Bible as we know it today. The canon of the Bible. The word canon can have different meanings. In relation to the Bible, it refers to its canonicity, which means regarded as authoritative scripture, determined as being divinely inspired. The word canon coming from the Greek word meaning rule or measuring rod. In this case, a rule of faith or a measure of its authenticity as divinely inspired scripture. The Council of Trent in 1546 declared decisively the canon of the Bible which included the seven books of the Old Testament as mentioned earlier. This was reiterated in view of the Protestant Reformation that caused a schism in the church at the time and which chose to leave these seven books out. Over the centuries as the church spread, the need was felt for the Bible to be translated once again in the language of the people just as St. Jerome had done in the 4th century into Latin, but this time into English, which was the most universally used language. From the 8th century, parts of the Bible began to be translated into English, and in the latter 14th century, the first English Bible was formed. With the advent of the printing press in the 15th century, the first print form of the Bible came in the early 16th century, that is 1505, which opened the way for the accessibility of scripture to the faithful. And study by the church of the texts of scripture has continued over the years to understand from the original languages of Hebrew, Greek and Latin 
the true and fuller meaning and intent of the divinely inspired author of the text. Hence the different translations improved over the years that the church presents to us. The point we must remember is that we should not read the Bible as a book of history in time, but rather as the history of God's salvation of his people and draw on the essence of what the writer wishes to convey about God's steadfast and covenanted love for his people. Dear viewers, in the next session on this series on the word of God, we shall dwell on the fuller meaning of the word of God and the task of the church in giving us the Bible. I pray that this background to how we got the Bible will help towards a better understanding of the text of the Bible. Though a fuller understanding involves much more and a deeper study and may it serve to answer those of you who may have asked the question regarding why the Catholics and the Protestants have a different Bible or why the Catholics have seven additional books which are regarded as divinely inspired scripture. I pray to that we'll, we will appreciate the tremendous scholarly and inspired effort of the Catholic Church to have given us the canon of the Bible, scripture that is inspired by God, useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. The second letter of St. Paul to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. And that through scripture, we may come to know, to experience the God of love.